So thank you. I'm, uh, my name is Brian Olson. I'm a member of the Department of Agri Agri Agribusiness and Agricultural Economics here at the University of Manitoba. And uh, this is a real treat in my career is being associated with the uh, whole uh, Kraft Foundation effort and as one of the efforts uh, or within that umbrella is the Kraft Lecture. And this is the 10th annual Kraft Lecture. And uh, I have to admit something today uh, in terms of uh, trying to get advertisement out for our speaker, Dan Sumner. Um, I, uh, along with my associates, surrender, tried our best for the lecture. But Dan had another uh, seminar this afternoon. And we decided it might be dangerous to do too good a job in terms of getting the word out that Dan was giving a, a seminar on marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> and so a few of us had the treat to, uh, uh, to have Dan give a seminar in terms of the marijuana experience so far in California, uh, where uh, we started way behind them, but we've now left them in our dust. <laughs> and so uh, it was very interesting hearing Dan uh, uh, discuss that. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll get a, a better introduction to Dan in just a minute. Uh, we're going to try to go through the uh, program uh, fairly quickly today uh, in terms of the uh, early introduction. And so I'm going to say a few words here. And uh, we'll likely, uh, we likely go till 4.30. Uh, and I think Dan will be more or less finished his full presentation by something like 4.10 and that'll leave us another 20 minutes or so for, uh, for questions. And, uh, and so, uh, in terms of, uh, of welcome, welcome. And I'd like to just sort of uh, mention a few individuals here. First of all, I'd like to welcome those who haven't been to this craft lecture before. I hope that you enjoy it so much that uh, you'll be with us like many of the individuals who some stumbled onto this lecture a long time ago, uh, such as my friend Craig, I was talking to him, I think he's here just about every year, and has been here every year, and a number of other individuals uh, along similar lines. Um, and to the returning craft lecture friends, thank you for your continued support of this effort. The Dean's Office is represented uh, quite uh, handedly here today, I think, and uh, Dean Wittenberg is, uh, is here in the audience, and thank you for your support for this effort, uh, Dean. It's uh, been a real help to us. Um, and uh, welcome staff, both the academics and the office staff, uh, for their uh, support and attendance of this function. Students. Thank you students for, uh, for being here and uh, I hope that this is uh, an example of some of the great types of functions that are held at the University of Manitoba uh, and uh, for uh, those <coughs> students that are in one of my classes, uh, you know, thank you for your support on, uh, on coming to this function as well. Uh, friends of Daryl and colleagues of Daryl, uh, I don't have to really say much, uh, uh, you know, about that, that support for this function. Uh, we uh, all have that deep friendship and uh, remembrance of Daryl, so thank you for being here. And uh, particularly those, and there's a number that were, that were involved in the initial fundraising, and it's so nice to see you all again in terms of, uh, of those individuals who know who they are. Uh, and so thank you for that initial fundraising effort and, uh, and, and your continued support. And uh, then uh, finally, uh, the family. We'll wait for Bob and Judy to get some seats here. <laughs> and finally, uh, the family. Uh, Daryl's wife, Myrna, son, Dar uh, son Danny, and, and wife, Maya. And uh, another family member, there's other family, but I'll just uh, mention one other family member, Pat, who uh, came in from Vancouver. And, uh, and so thank, 
I did get it right, Vancouver. Well, I went through Vancouver. I live in Salmon Arm. <laughs> oh, Salmon Arm. Okay, yes. How can I forget Salmon Arm? <laughs> Uh, and so thank you for uh, coming here for British Columbia Patty. <laughs> and so with that, then I'm going to move on to the next piece of the program. And uh, that's our department head, Derek Bruin, uh, who uh, will just sort of uh, give uh, some thoughts in terms of Daryl Craft, the person, the educator, and the agriculture policy guy. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for 10 years of efforts on this uh, this this uh, talk and the efforts for the, the Kraft Foundation. Welcome everyone, thank you for coming. I think you're uh, in for a thought-provoking presentation and I don't want to delay that too much, but I am. it's my honor to talk a little bit about the legacy of Dr. Darrell Kraft. Darrell was born in 1945. He was uh, raised on a ranch southwest of Medicine Hat, Alberta, God's country. In uh, 1968, he graduated from the University of Manitoba with a bachelor's degree in agricultural economics, and he was awarded a PhD in agricultural economics from Washington State University. His PhD dissertation was named the best in the United States by the uh, um, American Agricultural Economics Association. He joined our department in 1973, over 30 years. Over the next 30 years, Daryl Kraft emerged as an outstanding educator and leading researcher in our, in our area. He had a gift for clear analysis, and his work encompassed a broad range of substantial studies on rural re real estate markets, agricultural production, various dimensions of agricultural policy, and international trade, very similar to tonight's speaker. Daryl's uh, excellence in research was recognized by the Canadian Ag Economic Society, who named him a fellow in 1999. Dr. Kraft knew the details of many institutions in Canada and Manitoba's food chains. He uh, was known for his research in, and service with numerous cooperatives, dairy boards, the Manitoba Rural Adaptation, Adaptation Council, the Winnipeg Commodity Exchange, he worked on the World Grain Outlook Conference and the Agriculture Committee uh, of the Manitoba Chamber of Commerce and the Cereal Processing Committee of Agriculture Canada. He received the Teaching Award of Merit from the National Association of Colleges and Teachers in, of Agriculture. Uh, and he worked on our Senate and as at, in our, within our department, he served as the head from 1997 until he passed away. Darrell's legacy included teaching policy to some 2,000 students. In the classroom, he also uh, supervised 40 graduate students and influenced our discipline with insightful, clear, articulate policy papers and presentations. He had a knack for explaining policy issues in a way that led to understanding those issues for students, for journalists, uh, for pundits, all, all through our supply chain. Dr. Summer has a similar reputation. And I recommend his Econ Talks podcast, very good overview of agriculture in, in the US. Dr. Kraft was known for his ability to quickly identify where pundits were going wrong and setting them straight. That was his wheelhouse. He was an excellent teacher and an analyst of Canadian ag policy. And I was lucky to see that up close when he uh, presented on things like supply management, railway transportation rates, support for ethanol and the performance of the CWB. And he had a, another special thing about him that he had these very divisive debates but was still friends with some of the people who were on the other side of the debate years later. Uh, in addition to funding this lecture every year for the last 10 years, the endowment provides a prize to agricultural policy paper uh, in, in a graduate class for, for a student every year and a fellowship for a graduate student every year. And this year's policy paper was won by Mr. Mitchell Armstrong. Is Mitchell here? I think Mitchell is a, in a job interview right now. <laughs> that's because that's, that's, we've trained him really well. But he, he said he wasn't sure he could, he could come. The graduate fellowship was won by Ms. Uh, Michelin LaHayette. Is Michelin here? Yeah, I'm right here. And did I say your name? Close to right? Okay, good. <laughs> Do, would you stand up? And is, was there any other award winners, paper award winners? The award winners? inaugural award, paper award winners, the top one. Uh, yeah, all of you. Anybody else who's won an award from from the fellowship? I, I know that Matt's here, and uh, 
I mean, Garrett Swalski is here. Uh, and is anybody that, that took classes from Daryl? <laughs> <laughs> so, so you, you are part of the legacy now. All right. Uh, just want to let you know that the past uh, uh, lectures are on our website, and, and Dr. Summers will be on our website. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the. Thank you, Derek. Very fitting remembrance of uh, Daryl. And uh, I'd now like to introduce you to uh, one of the family members. The family members have been here uh, steadfastly through each one of these seminars, and, uh, and uh, it's been such wonderful support uh, working uh, with, with the family uh, on, on this function and on the uh, old endowment. And, uh, and so I'm going to call Daryl's son, Dan, up for uh, a few minutes to just uh, share really anything he wants to, but I know that one of the things he wants to is just to remind folks that uh, the uh, foundation uh, is still running. Thanks, Brian. Uh, thanks, everyone, for, for coming to today's lecture. Uh, it's, it's a milestone. Uh, ten years is, uh, or ten lectures. Uh, I, I can recall about, about 15 years ago, sitting in my, uh, my mom's living room after dad's passing and thinking, you know, we want, we want to give back uh, to the university, to the, to the department, uh, but we wanted to do something to, uh, to honor my father. And uh, so uh, it took some time and some debate in terms of what, what it would look like, um, but I can tell you that as a family, we're proud of this, uh, and, and dad would be proud. Uh, so we've, we've built a, uh, an endowment fund that uh, supports uh, undergraduate paper uh, and award uh, for a policy. Uh, and again, uh, we talked about the fellowship award uh, that can be given to a graduate student each year and then to sponsor events like this uh, in a lecture series in my dad's honor. Uh, we're thrilled. And we really uh, uh, want to thank uh, the department um, all those people who graciously donated um, to to the fund, uh, and we're really like uh, we're really proud of what, uh, what what's accomplished. So thank you very much. Um, we're very proud. Um, we got our latest update uh, as of March of this past year. Our fund is uh, at uh, seven hundred and sixty thousand uh, dollars. So that gives us an opportunity each year to give back in terms of scholarships to awards. Uh, we want this to be given in perpetuity, so every year we want to make sure that, you know, right now with that fund, we're about $25,000 each year can go back to students and, and, and to, to attract the brightest and support those, those uh, fellow uh, graduate students who want to pursue uh, uh, their, their graduate degrees. Uh, and we're really excited. We're always looking to raise more money so that we can give more money back to, back to students and to the department. Uh, but we're really, uh, really feel very fortunate for how successful it's been today. To and we want to thank everyone, and especially to the department. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. It has really been an exemplary uh, effort, and I think when you consider uh, that. Uh, Certainly, uh, there have been significant donors, uh, many of them on the family side, but also uh, just a tremendous number of small donors. And uh, in this day and age, that's a hard thing to do. And so uh, we thank you for that steadfast support and the continuous support at, at keeping it going. I know Myrna just uh, checks the, uh, the status of the fund every month and, uh, and, and, and has been just steadfast in her support here. So I'd, I'd like to turn this over to uh, Ryan Cargill. He's going to introduce the speaker. I would like to say that, uh, that Dan Sumner uh, is the 10th. The inaugural uh, speaker was Alex McCalla, which seems like just yesterday, 10 years ago. And he also was from Davis. So uh, you can get from that that Davis is one of the powerhouses in terms of good agriculture policy in North America. Here's Ryan Cargill. So I'm going to be very quick. I know you aren't here to hear me uh, talk, but I'd just like to let you know a little bit about Dan so you know who you're listening to. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce him. He's, uh, he has his PhD from the University of Chicago in economics. 
and on his supervision committee were three Nobel Prize winners, interestingly, so uh, very well trained. Um, he's now the Frank H. Bach Jr. Distinguished Professor at UC Davis in Agricultural and Resource Economics. Um, he's done pretty much everything an academic economist could hope to do in their career. He's, he's got great research, including publications in our top journals. You know, a visit to his Google Scholar page requires you to click that show more button at the bottom many, many times to get through all his papers. And he's edited and written and contributed to most, many books in our, in our discipline, including the, the uh, sort of staple handbook of agricultural economics. Um, as an instructor, he's supervised and taught and mentored many students at NC State and at Davis, uh, some of whom I know he still works with and researches with. Um, and in addition to his very prodigious academic career, he's devoted a lot of time to public service and to extension, including serving on the U.S. President's Council of Economic Advisors and as Deputy Assistant uh, Secretary at the USDA uh, several years ago. Um, another thing that Dan is very good at, which makes him very suitable for today, is, is distilling uh, his technical and his academic work into lessons and language for a general audience. Um, so actually, Derek mentioned this Econ Talk episode that he did. Econ Talk is this sort of nerdy podcast about academic uh, economics. And Dan did one a while ago in which he, he discusses the political economy behind U.S. farm subsidies and, and trade policies. And it's, it's just fantastic, even if you're not an economist. Um, and actually, I teach three courses in agricultural policy here in this at diploma degree and undergrad level, and it's required this thing for all three of those courses. Um, you know, he talks about U.S. policy and that, but the lessons that he, he provides in that sort of transcend borders, and, and it's, it's great for learners at all different levels, and I think that will come through today um, in his talk. So, um, without further ado, and by the way, he, despite my warnings, he didn't tell me he was going to talk about supply management today. I told him not to do it. Um, so, without further ado, please uh, help me and, and welcome Dan Summer. And I'll try to put this one over here so it doesn't give any. Um, yeah, a couple of years ago, the, um, a lady who's now called the Cannabis Czar of California called me up and asked me, uh, because I do work on all kinds of agricultural commodities, asked me if I'd work on, on, on marijuana policy. And of course, I said no, because I, didn't, I had plenty of other things to do. Uh, she persisted. And I finally, I said, you know, I just don't do drugs anymore. That was a long time ago. <laughs> And, and, uh, and the honest to God truth was I actually, when I was a master's student, I guess I was working on my PhD at Michigan State University, uh, uh, but I left after my master's. A buddy, uh, a buddy and I, he was from Georgia, we decided we would do production economics on marijuana. Uh, that was a long time ago. We actually knew people uh, then that were growing marijuana. So we sent them an official form. Uh, asking them for all their production information. And we abandoned the project when his brother wouldn't even respond to our survey. <laughs> so we said that wasn't going anywhere. We had to do something else. Uh, but I, I've tried to avoid letting drugs take over my life. Uh, and and uh, I'm not going to talk about that, uh, that today, unless we want to switch slides, and then I'll go to that, that one. No. Uh, but I do want to talk about uh, North American agricultural policy, and I'm going to uh, really get down to cases to make a point uh, that, that I think will come across. So why don't we, why don't we leap into it? And, and I, uh, I met Darrell a few times uh, early in my career, also early in his career, uh, and, and, and it is true that uh, we both uh, worked on, on policy issues and, spent, and we both spent a lot of time trying to talk to people about policy issues to see if we could move the, the needle in a direction that we thought was useful. Uh, and uh, we didn't fail every time. <laughs> but, but I don't think any economist would brag about the quality of agricultural uh, economic policy thinking that it gets it all right either. So there's still work to be done. I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about a couple of things that I think are, are, are maybe uh, potential success stories along the way. So let me do that. Let me see if this button works. Which way do I punch this thing to make this button work? That button doesn't work. Let's try this. Uh, yeah, I want to start off with why trade. Uh, because there's a lot of people that, that think trade is, is somehow... Uh, Something, there's some foreign notion of tra trading with foreigners, and I always make the point that trade comes first. In fact, it's genetic. Uh, 
All animals trade. It's just a natural thing to do because you're better off. You find somebody who wants something you have, they have something you want, you work out a deal. That's just natural. And in fact, it's millennia before there were ever anything called nations. Trade came first. That's what was natural. Nations really aren't a natural thing at all. Families are natural, but lumping together thousands and thousands and millions of people and you know, having them all wear the same hat uh, is a very odd thing, a very odd thing. And, and if, you, if you think of it that way, it takes, in fact, one of the reasons for nations to be powerful is because it's really hard to stop people from trading. Uh, North Korea tries, even they can't do it, and they really work at it, I mean, in, in a terribly violent way. So my point is that trade is natural, benefits of trade are obvious, uh, and you sort of have to sort of twist things around to somehow think that tariffs or, or, or trade quotas or other things can make some sense. Uh, not everyone gains. So uh, if, if, if Brian and I want to make a deal, you know, it, you know, it could be possible that Derek, would, who was already making a deal with Brian, would say, hey, wait a second, I'd rather have you stop. Don't make a deal. You two guys are better off, but I'd rather have you stop. Well, he's not powerful, pow powerful enough to stop us, so he'll go to the government to get us to stop. And that's, that's the logic of it. And when you say it that way, you say, huh? Why, why are we doing that? That seems odd. Uh, but not everybody wins, and that's something you recognize. Uh, I'll mention a couple of antecedents. Uh, a, a wonderful book from generations ago written by Gail Johnson was right after they started the WTO, it wasn't called the WTO at the time, it was called the GATT, I wrote a book about agriculture, trade and agriculture inconsistent policies. Because that, you know, that was coming out of the depression of World War II and the idea of opening agricultural markets was still a foreign idea. So we had this deal coming out of World War II that said, gee, if countries could trade with each other, they're less likely to shoot at each other. And that's actually worked out pretty well uh, over now, however many decades that is. It really is the case that countries that trade with each other are less likely to shoot at each other. Uh, but, but it was hard to bring agriculture into the GATT, and that was the phrase early in my career. That was the way it was talked about. In fact, Gail Johnson wrote a book uh, a generation later called uh, World Agriculture in Disarray that was talking about these very strange policies. So you end up growing products that are not particularly well suited for one place because you ban the imports from somewhere else. And you subsidize agriculture here in the United States and in Canada. Uh, meanwhile, you were penalizing agriculture at that time in India or, or, or China, for example, at that time. And it really didn't make a lot of sense. That was the disarray. Well, there's still disarray. But, but a lot of those things that Johnson pointed to in the 1970s have now faded away. We've actually made some progress. Sort of what we would consider sort of normal economic logic that uh, students here would have gotten in their first economics class or their second economics class. That kind of economic logic actually has made some success. But of course there remain issues to consider. A friend of mine sit, sent me an email. Well, I don't know what he was doing reading weird tweets but he sent me an email uh, quoting a couple of treats. He says, tariffs are worth, uh, no, this is not my friend, this is, uh, I, I don't know who writes these, but it's, it's, a, it's a Twitter account called at real Donald Trump. Tariffs are working big time. Every country on earth wants to take wealth out. That is by selling something. So the, the definition of taking wealth out is to sell you something that you'd like to buy. Uh, I say as they come, tax them. We don't want to be taxed. Uh, and then he says, um, we're trillion dollars in debt while at the same time we need to reduce taxes for our people. We'll make, so what my friend says, does he really not know who pays? I mean, if, if we put on a tariff on some Chinese product coming into the US, I pay more for it. So who pays for it? I, uh, anyway, there, is, there are still things let me say it this way, there is still disarray to consider. Um, talk about free trade agreements. I, I, I like this one. I, I didn't have a picture of Alexander Hamilton other than this one, so I use this.
But it makes the point, Alexander Hamilton is considered one of the founding fathers of the United States. He was a first uh, treasury secretary, is famous now for having a Broadway play named after him. I think that's about it, and, uh, which is mostly rap music, as I understand. Uh, so some, there, are, there are a lot of people in the United States who know who Alexander Hamilton is now, not from seventh grade, but from uh, hearing the rap music version. But his point, uh, I think, was that you could have a free trade agreement within states in a country. And in fact, I argue that there's something lovely about trade agreements. Um, this is a phrase that um, uh, Adam Smith used in the theory of moral sentiments we were talking about earlier today, where lovely here means should be admired, something that should be admired. And the idea in, in this case was the U.S. had, had uh, 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 separated from Britain, uh, uh, Canada didn't. There was some designs to that, of course, as you know. Uh, and, but, but there was no nation there because, in fact, each colony had a tariff. You couldn't trade between, the, and it, it made no sense. And, in fact, the whole thing was going to fall apart until 1887 when they uh, decided to have a free trade agreement in America. It's lasted a long time. And, in fact, there are disputes about it. So right now, in California, we're about ready to vote on a proposition that says uh, wherever they come from, any uh, pork chop uh, consumed in California will have to come from a, uh, a pig whose mother was raised in standards that meet California standards. Uh, and we are going to vote for it. I know we will, because we always do. Uh, uh, and and the, uh, by the way, the advertisements uh, on the television and the like are, do you want to be mean to animals or nice to animals? Take your pick. And fortunately, I, I says, I think it's fortunate, most people like to be nice to animals. But that's the way it's portrayed. So that's a, that is potentially a violation of this trade agreement across states. The people in Iowa, the hog farmers in Iowa say, gee, if we want to buy a pig from Manitoba, we don't want to have to get a certification of how the mother was treated in Manitoba. That, that's, that's a little much uh, for that pork chop to be consumed in California. But those kind of disputes happen, and they're adjudicated. They're dealt with. There's a forum for that. It's called the Supreme Court. Canada has very similar uh, things. I've, in fact, testified in front of the uh, Canadian International Trade Tribunal, where there's a very judicial process, a very systematic process, where judges make some decisions based on evidence. And I would argue that that's this rule of law. Uh, I occasionally give talks where I say nice things about lawyers, which is, always throws people, because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to, I can also uh, go for an hour with lawyer jokes, which my brother the lawyer sends me, but I, I won't do that. Um, yeah, I, I do want to make this point that uh, Canada I'm from California, as was stated. This happens to be fresh fruit exports uh, from the United States. Most of these come from California. Look at the top two uh, uh, destinations there. Uh, even more important to us is fresh vegetables. Uh, look at that one. Uh, so when uh, uh, NAFTA was being renegotiated, uh, folks in California had a real interest, and it didn't have to do with wheat didn't even have much to do with dairy products, which I'm going to go into some detail here in a few minutes, without ever saying the word supply management. Hardly ever. Uh, but, but the point is, uh, trade's important. And because of NAFTA, uh, Canada is essentially treated as a North American market, as it was for uh, cattle and hogs, and as we were just talking about. When I mentioned uh, how the mother is treated in Manitoba, that's a standard part of the trade. The hog business is just natural to have a hog be born in Manitoba, go to Iowa, and the pork chop is eaten at my, my dining table in, in California. And we just sort of take it for granted. And the same thing is true if you have some lettuce or carrots on your table or, or some, some celery uh, here in, in Winnipeg. Uh, when I say I'm going to get to cases, uh, these guys are interested in a case of wine, uh, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm going to focus. Uh, there is a wine dispute. It's not a, it's not a Manitoba dispute, but Canada is now trying to defend itself 
in front of the WTO, uh, being challenged by not just the United States, but some Europeans as well, over uh, uh, a law in, the Brit in British Columbia that I, I call the separate but equal uh, proposition. Uh, uh, it works essentially like this. If you have a, a wine that's imported, you can sell it in British Columbia. They, they will allow it to be sold. Um, but it has to go in the back of the store in, in the ghetto section. It, it can't be up with the BC wines. Um, and they say, well, that's no problem. It, you, know, you can still buy it if you go back there. Well, uh, the rules within the World Trade Organization, a contract that Canada signed and the US signed, uh, says that once something comes in, it has to get national treatment. You can't treat it any worse. Once it, it's gotten in your country, you can have a tariff. But once it's in, you can't treat it any worse than your domestic stuff. Because otherwise, why would you ever have a trade agreement if you, if you agree, say, to low tariffs, but then you can do all kinds of other stuff internally to discourage consumption? Uh, there's no reason to do it. Well, that case will be adjudicated. It'll be settled in a civilized kind of a way. People will argue about it. Uh, we may not agree on how the judges turn out, but there'll be three independent judges from other countries, not from the US or Canada or, or those parts of the European Union involved here. And they'll, on the basis of a bunch of arguments and the contract, so they'll compare the economic arguments to the contract we signed, it's called a WTO agreement, and they'll decide. Uh, well, there are a number of these things that get worked out. Uh, I'm gonna first talk about milk. Uh, in California, we think of uh, milk like this. Uh, uh, almond milk is, I don't know, if, do, do people use almond milk in, uh, in your coffee or wherever on your cereal here? I, I'm stunned. I, I, think. I work with the almond industry a lot, by the way. I've written a lot about almond stuff. Uh, but I also work with the dairy industry. The, the two biggest uh, agricultural industries other than cannabis in California are, are almonds and, and uh, milk, dairy. And... Uh, the, the milk muddle I want to talk about, though, isn't almonds. As far as I know, Canada is reasonably open to having almond milk come in. Uh, it's not, it, which ought to worry you. So if there's, if there's anybody here who works with the dairy industry or is connected to the dairy industry, tell them to go after almond milk. That's a, uh, there's a trade case waiting to happen there, too, I think. There is a controversy within the United States, and the dairy industry is protesting the almond people calling it milk at all, just using the word. Uh, but, um, and we'll see how that one turns out. Uh, all over the world, milk has a, a legacy of government controls. And I'm gonna talk about, very briefly, US and Canada. I have a more academic presentation on this, so if somebody really, really wants to see the equations, uh, we can get to that. But, but I'll probably do that in the, in the discussion afterwards. So the U.S. has, uh, the, the U.S. is a major exporter of milk, a commercial exporter of milk, but the industry hasn't, it qu hasn't quite sunk into much of the industry because it's relatively new. It's a transition over the last 20 years that the U.S. got better and better at producing milk. Um, a lot of the domestic policy ignores that. So we have a set of domestic rules where you, raise the price of certain products, in particular beverage milk, and, and that, by implication, drives down the price of the milk, milk powders and cheeses and things like that that tend to be traded around the world. Hardly anybody uh, trades liquids internationally unless they're very valuable, like high-priced wines. So, so, but, so milk isn't traded as a beverage isn't traded much, but milk powders and butter and cheese is traded a lot around the world. Well, so th what this ends up doing is pushing some of that lower uh, uh, price product out and, and the higher price product stays in the country. Uh, and then in the US, there's still a few residual high tariffs in sort of some weird milk products that don't do much for the market as a whole, but, they, but they're on the books and they look odd because the, as I say, it's a big exporter with tariffs. It, there's no particular reason for them. Canada's a little bit different, like a lot different when it comes to milk. Canada holds down production, so rather than encourage production with the policy, it holds down production very explicitly with a, 
with a domestic quota system. I'm not going to say supply management. Uh, a domestic uh, uh, marketing quota and production quota system. And then uh, for some other products and more recently, and, and that creates an uh, asset value because you have a high prices and you hold down production. Again, we could go through the equations, but we don't need to. It's just common sense. You hold down production, you raise prices. Well, that creates some value for the people that are in the business. If you have the right to do the business, you got some value there. And, and those high prices get capitalized into something, and in this case, it's a government-created asset. So you can have, I, the example there, you could have $20,000 or $200,000 worth of cows, fairly good size herd, but the quota to operate the cows, the cows aren't worth anything unless you can sell the milk, and it costs you $2 million. It's $2 million is the asset for the milk, which means if you're an individual farmer, that's pretty, I mean, that's, that's the wealth. That's the value of the farm. The farm itself, yeah, it's real money, but the real asset is, is the, and that depends on the government policy. It's not, not worth anything if you don't have the government policies. So there's, here's the U.S. Uh, dairy picture relative to uh, 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 how much U.S. imports and exports. Uh, we're now exporting 15 or 20 percent, almost 20 percent now, of, of dairy production in the country. It's about like wine, not as much as almonds, but it's a, it's a big deal to export. A lot of that milk is produced in California, by the way, and shipped all over uh, uh, Asia, and also uh, some of it heads into the rest of the United States. Uh, what's happened, however, is that um, here in North America, we like fat. Uh, we ship a lot of the non-fat out, and because the demand for fat's gone up, the nutritionists spent years telling us to avoid fats. And then they turned around and said, whoops, sorry about that. It, we were wrong. Uh, you got fat because we told you to uh, eat carbohydrates. You should have been eating fats all along. So we said, OK, that sounds like a good idea to me. And, and uh, ice cream uh, and other fat demand went out. Well, uh, nobody told the cows. So they still produce. Fat and protein in the same proportions are almost. There's little adjustments there, and people are working on it. But it comes out of the cow as milk, a bunch of water, throw that away. And then you've got the fat and the non-fat solids. And the problem is with the demand for fat, what the natural thing in Canada, the dairy industry said, great, keep expanding the quota for fat. But this non-fat stuff that comes along with it, we've got to figure out something to do with it. That's a problem. So what do we do with it? Um, we, we basically, I don't know, maybe export it. Well, we can't export it from Canada because our prices are high. Well, so we'll allow a special class of milk that we'll call, uh, I don't know, we'll make up a number, it doesn't matter, seven, and then ship it out uh, of the country at very low prices. And you can imagine that would be annoying to the people in the rest of the world. Because they'd say, wait a second, you have really high prices in your country, but you're exporting in a low country. It even seems like a subsidy to some people. So here's fat prices, and you see uh, they're way above, uh, 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 this is U.S. prices, but it, or California, but this essentially, the, the one that's uh, blue and gold there uh, happened to be uh, uh, U.S. prices, but they could just as well be international prices. They're about the same. Because the U.S., I showed you a picture, the U.S. is a big exporter of these products. If you look at the non-fat solids uh, prices, they're, they're much further apart. And so the only way that Canada could, could, we lost half of our presentation, but everybody can see this side? Okay. Um, the, the, uh, those prices are really different. And so what is going to happen, you've got, this pressure, and of course, when we were talking in the NAFTA context, uh, it wasn't going to be handled in a judicial way. It wasn't going to be handled systematically with evidence. It was just public relations. And we all, on both sides of the border, people were listening, were hearing about squabbles and, and politicians uh, insulting each other and, and things like that. In Canada, it's just obvious, it's obvious to me anyway, you've got 15 or 20 billion dollars that an industry has been promised of, of wealth. 
that isn't there without the government guaranteeing it. It's just gone. Uh, uh, early in my career, I taught in North Carolina where they had a tobacco and a peanut quota that was very similar. It was guaranteed by the government. If, if, it, if the government relaxed the policy, the, the, the wealth was gone. Uh, as it turns out, Canada's probably an efficient dairy producer. You can't tell because of your holding back. And it, it is probably the case that the United States or New Zealand would export almost nothing to Canada if it weren't for the supply management program. Oops, the, these quotas. Uh, and that is to say, Canada's pretty good at producing milk, but uh, quite reasonably from the point of view of the dairy industry, holding back production, ho keeping prices high, is, a, is, a, is a, a lucrative thing to be doing. But it keeps the industry smaller than it would otherwise be. The odd thing about it is if, the U.S. would have in NAFTA, uh, or if, if there would be a WTO case that would open the Canadian market, there probably wouldn't be very much trade. Uh, prices in Canada would fall a lot. Uh, somebody who likes a, a grilled cheese sandwich would say, great, this is, gr this is good, I'm all for it. Uh, you know, I've saved uh, 50 bucks a year. The dairy industry would not uh, uh, be, be better off in terms of the, the people that own the quota. Now, a new farmer who doesn't own any quota at all, they would be better off, but the quota owners would clearly lose. That could be a WTO case. That could be coming. New Zealand could bring that case. They would be the natural. Uh, they may not want to bother because they may have done this analysis. Well, they have. I know that. They've done this analysis, and they say, we could bring that case. We think Canada is probably violating the rules, but there's not much in it for us because they're actually pretty good even though the prices now are really different, I showed you that on a slide, it, you know, why bother? We're not going to get much trade. They'll just, we'll cause a transfer from uh, farmers to consumers within Canada, but there's not much for us. Uh, the U.S. president hadn't done this analysis, evidently. Uh, and there were a couple of co-ops in, in New York and Wisconsin who had some other, who also hadn't done the analysis not this analysis, or this wasn't what was important to them. Uh, so we have this policy instead. I love this slide. I'm sorry, I just couldn't resist. Uh, yeah, there you have it. All right. Uh, so that would solve the problem, I suppose. Do you want to take a picture of that? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. This is now a standard joke around the U.S. I, I've seen it several places. Uh, so, so I mentioned the WTO as a way to solve dairy policy uh, uh, conflicts. I wasn't proposing it, but that would be a way to do it. Uh, the WTO it takes panels. You have some experts. You adjudicate something. You go back and forth. Uh, you have professional arguments. I've been involved in several of these, nothing having to do with milk. Uh, and in the... Uh, the it evolves as you learn more, just like law in Canada, you learn more about what the law meant by having a dispute settled. And it's essentially a contract. You've got a contract. How do you figure out what the contract really means? Well, you, you have some sort of agreement. You have a dispute of some sort. So enforcement uh, is a good thing, and that's essentially what the WTO by the way, the little girl sitting on the statue is the same girl that was eating ice cream in that earlier picture. So uh, I, I've been doing this stuff a while. Um, so uh, when the WTO was, was created back in the 90s uh, by the US and Canada, really, with a little bit of help from the European Union, uh, people said, oh, it's just terrible. This was a front page of The Economist magazine. Uh, as, as it turns out, what the WTO these days is just a modest tool. There's an agreement, essentially a contract among everybody that wants to join. There are now 150 countries in the WTO. Most of, uh, most of us couldn't name uh, half those countries. I mean, they're countries that you've never heard of, but they want to be a part of the WTO because it's a set of contracts that settle trade disputes so that we can actually deal with things. It's not just a matter of power politics. It's a matter of, 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 uh, of, a, of a set of agreements. 
And what I think is the beauty of the deal, and this is something that a lot of people don't realize, uh, is there's no army here. Uh, the guys with the blue helmets, that's the UN, that's not the WTO. So there's, you could say, well, there's no way to enforce anything. How do you enforce it? And the way it's enforced is by the country that wins is given the white right to withdraw concessions. It's called retaliation by some people, but it's really saying, gee, you've agreed to have low tariffs. If you raised your tariff, we'll penalize you by raising our tariffs for a similar amount of stuff in a way that causes you political pain. So in a case I'm going to show you in a few minutes, uh, what Canada said was, let's see, where is there some influential congressmen and senators? How about California? We'll raise our tariffs on California wine. That's a good one. And in fact, right now in the dispute between Canada, I mean, excuse me, between China and the United States, which is handled completely outside the WTO, where it's just political rhetoric, uh, uh, guys that I know very well are facing essentially trade bans, informal trade bans into China for almonds, walnuts, pistachios, uh, some dairy products, uh, some alfalfa hay, and a number of things, to the tune of about $4 billion of losses. And, and they have nothing, to, they can't sue anybody. I mean, there's nobody to even complain to, uh, to, to try to solve the dispute. And, and that's different here. Here you can have a dispute where the two sides, uh, they, they don't have to come to a, uh, and if, if you don't come to a resolution, well then, the, both countries just keep their, uh, their barriers in place. Uh, that almost never happens. There's one famous case. The European Union uh, has a very high barriers on Canadian and U.S. Uh, beef that is exported. In fact, almost no Canadian and U.S. beef goes to the European Union because they have an anti-hormone policy. Um, and uh, they've, they've just recently, that's been going on for 30 years, they've just recently said they're probably going to relax it. So trade rules, um, yeah, so governments try to uh, uh, in block trade and the WTO is a process. I argue, and this is one place where I say more lawyers, you don't need more lawyers, but focus on these issues where you don't complain, you don't just uh, uh, send tweets. If you think somebody's offending something in an actual, where you actually have a legal right in an economic rationale, you bring the case. Uh, so I'm going to talk about cool, because that's a because uh, I was a cool econometrician, and I like it. Uh, I, some of you remember Stan Getz. Uh, there was a there was a, a, a period in jazz called the Cool School. Uh, some uh, and many of you would know the Getz Gilberto uh, uh, collaboration. Uh, in a song called Girl from Iponimo, where there's a beautiful saxophone solo. Uh, Canada and Mexico challenged the U.S. not over a tariff or a trade ban, but over a complicated regulation having to do with country of origin labeling, which is what COOL stands for. So in, in 2002, in a farm bill, the U.S. said, gee, we're going to require labels that don't tell you where the pork chop's coming from. It tells you where the baby pig was born. It's not telling you how to raise the mother of the baby pig, but it's going to tell you where the baby pig was born. And Canada and Mexico, and the same thing applied to calves coming from Mexico. And Canada and Mexico said so that didn't make any sense. The general rule is it's, if there's been a substantial transformation of a product, then it's a, a product of where the substantial transformation happened. So you don't call an automobile a, a product of Argentina because the hide that was used to make the seeds the, the seats was from a cow that was from Argentina. Uh, the, it's been substantially transformed. It's not a cow anymore, it's a car. So we'll call it a car. And so in this case, the pig comes from Manitoba, gains, uh, I don't know, 250 pounds in, in Iowa, uh, is turned into a pork chop in Nebraska. It's no longer really a product of Canada. That was the argument. Uh, but, but who cares? Why would it matter? Uh, in, in this case, Canada and Mexico brought the case. There was lots of, and, and it had to do with what are called technical barriers to trade, not a tariff, but a technical barrier, some rule that isn't treating it once it, get it gets in the country in the same way. And that's, 
case, it's very similar to the wine that I mentioned earlier. Well, it turns out they, uh, Canada and Mexico brought the case. There was a panel of judges. They ended up agreeing, for the most part, with Canada and Mexico. Very technical legal issues I'm not going to talk about. Uh, the U.S. appealed, which was, was, their, was their right. The appellate body said, you have to fix it. Uh, you're still out of compliance. The U.S. was given a few months to change their rules. They changed their rules. Canada and Mexico said, you made it worse. What's this about? Uh, and so they sued again. Uh, there was a, they call it a compliance. The U.S. could appeal that. They lost, the U.S. lost, it appealed. And finally, after they lost that appeal, it's over. There's no going to a Supreme Court again and again and again. It's over. This is about four or five years later. And at that stage, and these things take a while, no matter what court system you're in. In fact, the WTO is probably fa certainly faster than U.S. courts. Uh, but it it's, moves along. Uh, and at that point, they said, okay, you get to retaliate. You can withdraw concessions. And that's where they said, okay, number one, California wine. Number two, they went down politically saying, we don't want to do these things, so we want you to change. And I'm going to talk about that. Uh, and I was actually the econometrician working for Ottawa on this. Uh, a good friend of mine, a former student uh, who's from Quebec originally, uh, uh, Sebastian Pouliot, uh, is, an Iowa, is a professor at Iowa State University, and he was Mexico's expert, interestingly enough. Uh, so, in fact, it, there was one stage where he was going to uh, do the Mexican testimony at the WTO in Geneva, Switzerland, in French, but we thought that would just, uh, that would be too mind-boggling for, for people, so, so we decided not to do that. Uh, yeah, I, let me, let me skip that. It all had to do with certain uh, a country of origin labeling rules, and the argument was that it disadvantaged imports. Uh, I, I put this slide there only so that I get to show you uh, this album cover from Miles Davis, who actually had an album called The Birth of the Cool, which, uh, which is uh, maybe the best trumpet solos ever. But... Uh, a couple of facts. One, there was this integrated market before. Two, uh, even though the U.S. was claiming there was a big demand for these labels, in fact, there never been a label. There, was, there were lots of labels. If you go to the meat case, there's lots of labels on a package of meat, but there was never one that said uh, this animal was from Iowa or this animal was born in the United States and this animal wasn't. There's no interest in that, it turned out. Interest in all kinds of other stuff. You can find out whether it's Angus or not. Uh, I don't know why you'd care, but you know, once it's, once it's a, a, a steak, you know, it's not like it's any different, but some people care and they're willing to pay for it. Uh, most uh, business people will allow people to pay what they want to uh, if they're willing. There's about 10% of the market in the United States was coming, was from animals that were born outside the United States. Uh, and there's what a label would look like. It says USA, USDA choice. It says premium. Who knows what that means? The mom reviews. I don't know whose mom it is, but it's a good thing to put on the label. You don't waste label space unless somebody's willing to pay something to see that there. So it makes you feel good. Uh, uh, price, of course, really matters. Uh, and how big it is. It's, it, thin cut, ribeye, lots of stuff on the label, but there's nothing about the origin of the animal, the, the birth certificate of the baby uh, 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 steer is not there. Uh, but what's the logic here? First, there has to be some, Canada wouldn't have complained unless they would, so uh, everybody in Canada knew, in fact everybody in the U.S. knew, that consumers didn't care. So it wasn't that anybody was going to try, so don't tell them that 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 pig was born in Manitoba because then they wouldn't want to buy it. That was not the issue. The issue was you could put some costs on the system that would be costly back to the animals in Canada. And here's the way it works. There, there are some costs of keeping them separate. Remember the imported animals, the baby, uh, the, the ones that were brought in as young animals uh, were about 10% of the market or so. So most of the slaughter facilities in the U.S. would say, we don't need to bother with them. In fact, that's what happened. Most slaughter facilities, once this was imposed, said, no, thank you. Uh, 
the supermarkets, they as well. They don't need stuff that was born in Canada. So what would get them to have the added cost for them of keeping things separate, which is a bother? If it was cheaper, how could it be cheaper if the young animal was cheaper? And that's the logic I want to go through. So you have a supply chain that's really relying on domestic production. That wouldn't be true for lettuce in Canada, for example. Most of the lettuce in Canada isn't born in Canada. It's born in the US and comes to Canada later. So here you go. So we're trying to keep them separate. That's the Mexican. Um, actually, when they're live animals, it's cheap and easy. They have ear tags. You could keep separate pins. In fact, that's what they did. You have separate pins of Canadians and Mexican steers. They're all identical, really. They're the same herd, but you keep them separate. Uh, and you could do that. It costs a, a few pennies a pound, maybe. Uh, but you have to keep it separate through the slaughter facility, and that's where it's hard. And afterwards, because there's nothing, there's no ear tag left. Not after, if you've been through, can I talk about slaughter facilities here? I mean, this is, it's, there are some audiences where I've always, I use the word harvest when I talk to my students. I don't say slaughter. Um, Within 30 seconds, the identification of that animals. And in a North American facility, it's not like Switzerland where it's done by hand. They're going in all directions immediately. And keeping that separate within the slaughter facility is not feasible. So what they did, in fact, what they did was uh, uh, basically run all the uh, international animals on a Tuesday or something like that. Uh, so here's one with a label. It, right there, born, raised, and harvested. Yeah, yeah, in the, in the USA. So the bottom line of the logic is whatever costs that were added through this segregate, trying to keep them separate and not screwing it up because otherwise you're subject to a lawsuit, all of that cost has to go back to the imported animal. So in fact, I'm gonna show you a picture. Ah, there, there's another one. This one is born in Mexico raised and slaughtered in the United States. There you go. Uh, I, I can tell you, I've done a survey and I've asked people, what'd you think about those? Th those were on, all that was on the label for about five years. I never met anybody that noticed. <laughs> and I didn't know to meet anybody that didn't know they weren't there before or didn't know they were gone when they were not there. So that's, that's the, except a few people who were actually in the business of protesting. As it turns out, if you did a bunch of mathematics and did a simulation, you could find out what this does on, a, on fed cattle that came in. They could come in as feeder cattle or fed cattle. It was about 5% of the Canadian price. Is that enough worth fighting about? I'm gonna show you the numbers in a second. Um, I, I have this slide just because I like that calf. It's just so pretty, isn't it? Don't you agree? Uh, I'm required to show at least one supply and demand picture every presentation, it's a union thing. So, uh, <laughs> what can I, am I right? That's right, that's a, that's a rule. Uh, and so those of you in the back row that are taking an economics class, uh, you, this is gonna be on a midterm, so <laughs> you better get that. Uh, and the, the slides are gonna be available, right? Okay, good, so you can study. Uh, the U.S. responded to this by saying, pay no attention. We're not doing anything. It's okay. That's, that was basically the argument. They said the segregation costs are small, and besides, uh, the evidence that Canada shows didn't make any sense, and pay no attention to the guy behind the curtain. You know, they, it was really a blowing smoke, and they knew it, uh, frankly. Uh, here was some, here's some data. I'm not going to show you a lot of data. I'll just show you one slide of hogs. Uh, the rule came in in 2009, uh, uh, basically beginning of 20, 20, uh, end of 2008. There was a new rule here, uh, and by then it couldn't, the new rule couldn't do much uh, to the baby pig, or to the fed hogs, it had collapsed. Uh, feeder pigs were down, but they still needed them in the Midwest, so there were still some feeder pigs coming in. I don't show, I could show you the prices, prices also collapsed. That picture, that supply and demand picture said you either reduce the quantity or the price falls or both. And in this case, for most of these animals, both fell. 
price and quantity. In some cases, it was more a quantity decline. In other cases, it was more a price decline. Uh, so what were the losses? You can calculate the annual losses like this. Uh, I, you want to look at the pigs? All right. Uh, so you have labeling that affects the live hogs by reducing the quantity shipped and the price. When you do a quick calculation, which I did here, uh, you end up fed cattle price times quantity loss falls by about a little over half a billion dollars. Uh, feeder cattle was bigger than that. Hogs, it was about uh, uh, half a billion dollars. Uh, there's some, this is based on a bunch of econometrics. You end up Canada losing about $1.7 billion on the trade being shipped. That was my calculations. Uh, there's also losses within Canada because it suppresses losses within the domestic market too. Of course, Canadian consumers gain from that. Can say, can, the, you, you block the export market, the stuff stays home, Canadian consumers gain a little bit, but producers have an additional loss in addition to these. So, those numbers were presented, and the U.S., partly because the congressman from the wine districts uh, said this is not good, because what happened is Canada uh, won the case, uh, had retaliation awarded so that they threatened raising tariffs for more than a billion dollars on U.S. stuff. Mexico had several hundred billion, a million dollars of their own tariffs that were being raised, and the U.S. finally backed uh, down. In December, I think it says here, no, it was December of 2015 uh, that they backed down. You can see how it was received. Now you will not know which country your meat comes from. That was, the, uh, that was just before Christmas. Uh, just about every Democrat was against it. Uh, it was, uh, this was, uh, Obama was president, so the Democrats controlled the White House, uh, the Republicans co uh, controlled the Congress, and oddly enough, the Republicans voted with the Democratic president in this case. Um, it's come back. As you might expect, uh, this president uh, has said, I like country of origin labeling. In, if you put together, this is a year ago, he said, here's what a trade agreement it should have. You notice uh, stumpage fees, which is something that people in British Columbia enjoy. But these kind of things are still there, including country of origin labeling. Uh, notice uh, uh, he likes uh, anti-dumping and CVD, which Canadians have dealt with for decades in the United States, and lots of other things. It may be coming back. I have optimism. Uh, here, let me tell you, uh, this is my last slide, I think. My optimism about trade is partly because the anti-trade rhetoric, at least in the United States, has been so over the top that we went for a decade or two of sort of the, the compromise on trade that used to be the, in the middle had, had sort of disappeared. And you had extreme uh, uh, nationalists saying, well, we like trade, but just not with foreigners. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and then you had, you had uh, in, in the United States, in the left, well, we like foreigners, we just don't want to trade with anybody because we just don't like economics. And so the people that were, and, and those groups seem to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the people who, uh, in this room, for example, who don't, don't mind foreigners and kind of like the idea of trade, uh, ends up being a relatively small group. But the rhetoric currently is so um, weird that, that I think we're expanding that middle. And I've seen things in mainstream newspapers and even the New York Times saying positive things about trade uh, that it makes me a little bit optimistic even though some of the policy rhetoric by policymakers uh, hasn't yet gotten there yet. So I'm feeling better about potential for trade so, so in this round, for example, as I've been dealing uh, a lot with not being able to sh people not being able to ship pistachios to China, I get calls from reporters saying, tell us the economic problems that blocking markets are causing. Uh, I did an a, a interview program in, in Los Angeles where uh, people wanted to talk about 
how much wine grape growers had to pay more for the posts that they were putting in their vineyards because of the steel tariffs. The, the fact is that people in the United States are actually the ones that are buying steel and paying higher prices. And that that, I, I find that positive because for a long time, I would only hear about somebody being harmed by imports and exports were essentially irrelevant. Even to the point, I, I had a wonderful, this is my last story, I had a wonderful uh, call from somebody from uh, CBC Radio uh, when we were having a drought in California. It was about two years ago, 2015, three years ago. And she said, you know, I'm really concerned about your drought. I feel bad for you people in California. I want to put something on, on Canadian radio that will help you. I will suggest that Canadians avoid buying any products from California. Canada should avoid buying any wine in particular. So I want to explain to people that you wouldn't want to buy California wine because we want to be nice to the California wine industry. And, and so I sort of took a little while, but she, under, a very bright lady, she figured out after I explained it to her that it, you really don't do somebody a favor by not buying what they're trying to sell. And, and she did get that, but, but that was the kind of idea, the idea that trade is a bad thing and that, that we would hunker down and, and I don't know what, uh, drink all our own wine, I guess. I, you know, there are worse things that could happen. Uh, but but the, the point here is that just the intuition about trade, like I say, this is a very bright person, but she had never really thought through economic relationships. And I think that is something that is helping. Uh, when you have somebody uh, uh, like President Trump who has such a high profile making such nonsense about, about trade arguments, it actually helps. People say, gee, that didn't make any sense. And, and in fact, it doesn't. So, so th that's the silver lining I see in some of the recent things. Thank you very much. How do you want to manage this? Do we have a few minutes? We have a number of minutes. I know there's uh, a, a few individuals who uh, held back from leaving because they had some appointments that they had to uh, had to do, and so uh, my target was uh, 410, which Dan, beautiful, it's on this clock, very close to 410. Okay. Our clocks, uh, we have a funny policy here at the United States, or in the United States, <laughs> at the University of Manitoba, just to keep us on our, our, our toes as professors. Uh, the university uh, puts the clocks at slightly different time all over, <laughs> all over the different buildings and places. So, so it's, uh, it's going on for ten. And so, uh, why don't we uh, move into uh, say fifteen minutes of uh, of uh, a question period, and uh, then we'll uh, thank the speaker. So, uh, any questions here? Let's start off with our. Our, our illustrious policy teacher here at the University of Manitoba. Sure, so, I so, oh. Dan, do you, you want to just repeat it? Yeah, I'll, I'll repeat it. Okay, well, I'll, I'll try to speak louder. So, the, uh, no, it doesn't go through. The, the oh. question is, is uh, so at the beginning you told us it's natural to trade, but governments try to stop us from trading. And I, I know you talked about this elsewhere, but for the non-economists in the room, could you really succinctly summarize the political economy? Why do governments try and stop us from trading? Yeah, so uh, the gains from trade are the people that are trading back and forth. The, the, the losses may be a broader group of people that are, that are outside. And in particular, the losses, um, uh, if it, let, let me take an example. In the case of country of origin labeling, there are a whole bunch of people buying pork chops and steaks all over the United States. We have no idea where they're coming from and we don't really care. We never notice. You then have a few people just south of here who have cow-calf operations who recognize there's Canadian cattle coming across the border. Uh, and they say, you know, if we kept them out, our price could be a little bit higher. Now there's a handful of those people, but they each gain by a few million dollars. And so they are very concentrated. I was testifying in front of the International Trade Commission a decade ago. The senator from South Dakota at the time made what I thought was the, the clearest argument for this. 
he argued that South Dakota cattlemen were worse off because the, the trucks full of Canadian cattle actually had manure in them and it might spill on the roads. Uh, and so that was his argument, we had to keep them out. Uh, which I found interesting because it suggested something about South Dakota cattle that I didn't realize they actually, uh, but that's the kind of argument. Uh, that's, that was the, one of the better arguments I've heard for blocking that trade. Um, and, and, the, and the point was then essentially very specific. We have a handful of cowboys in South Dakota that would be better off, but they really care about it. And they cared about it so much that they got their senator uh, to argue it for them. Uh, whereas the senator from, I don't know, California, uh, with 40 million people that eat pork chops and steaks, didn't, uh, it didn't occur to them to, to get involved. And so the essential, and this happens for lots of policies. I would argue that that's a part of supply management in Canada for dairy. It's, and there I think there is a very high degree of wealth tied up with a group of people that really honestly don't think it would be fair to change the policy. And everybody else in Canada either says, fine, I don't care, or fine, gee, they're nice guys, give them the money. And it, it, because it's not very much money for, for every individual. It's, it's only a lot of money when it gets concentrated. That's the, the basic argument there. By the way, I grew up right behind that oak tree just to the left of that pine tree. Uh, this is my home valley. Yes, sir? You mentioned that there's no uh, transport or export of fluid milk, but it's only 150 kilometers to the border. We can send tanker trucks of fluid milk across the border pretty easily. Is there a non-tariff area that holds Canada back from shipping fluid milk to the U.S. processing? Uh, the, um, you don't need that um, because the price is a lot lower on the other side of the border, so that's not going to happen. Uh, the, 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 uh, not, not on the current system. Uh, there is a barrier to shipping it north for processing. There's prob there may well be a phytosanitary rule that I don't know about, but certainly the Canadian uh, tariff system will keep out fluid milk from going north. Now, there is packaged fluid milk that goes north. You know, I have friends who live in, 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 in Vancouver with a vacation house in Washington, and they never drive back north without having two or three six, uh, 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 gallons of milk because it's a little bit cheaper. But as a general system, uh, liquid uh, 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 milk isn't shipped, and partly because of the, also the, uh, uh, the, the three or 400 kilometers is about the maximum you're gonna get for packaged milk either from a bottler or from the cows themselves. Uh, in California, they'll go a couple hundred miles maybe. Occasionally, you'll go a little further than that, but it really doesn't pay because of transport costs. Cannabis would be a different deal. Uh, uh, it is so valuable relative to transport costs that if it were, um, easier, and in fact it probably, I don't know anything about it, but it probably is shipped all over North America. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Hi. You mentioned the uh, vote that's happening in California, and that's truly a segregation situation for all of the retailers in that state, and this is the first time we've been hit with it. Um, how, how, how does that state, how do those retailers adjust every time these votes happen and products have to be segregated? Yeah, so let me talk about eggs for a second. Uh, uh, it's the other, another supply management item in Canada, so there's no, there's no real eggs that go back and forth between, not even baby eggs uh, go back and forth between the U.S. And uh, that was a joke, I'm glad you noticed. Uh, go back and forth between uh, Canada and the U.S. But, uh, but a lot of eggs go from the Midwest to California. And in 2008, California passed a proposition that said all the eggs had to be from hens that were in bigger cages. Not cage-free, but just bigger cages. Actually, it wasn't clear, it wasn't even that clear. Uh, they were implemented it in January of 2015. Uh, it took a long time for that to, there was some legislative changes, three or four things. When it finally happened in 2015, as soon as they started implementing that, uh, they implemented it with a certification. The retailer had to certify that the farm had promised that the hens were in big cages. And, and uh, 
All over the Midwest, people built barns with bigger cages and took dividers out of uh, normal cages uh, to make the cage bigger and then had fewer hens in it and on and on and on. Uh, so there was a certification process. It's going to be more complicated on the pork chop case because it's, it's not the pig itself. It's, it's the mother of the pig. It's where the pig was born, and they, they move. Uh, the other thing is eggs are packaged at the farm, so, and you don't go through a slaughterhouse there. So you will have to have a separate facility or a separate day of the week. Uh, California is big enough. It's not like Vermont. Vermont could say this, and people say, who cares? You know, nobody lives there. Uh, or hardly anybody, you know, half a million people. But when it's 40 million people, it's a big enough market that you're going to pay attention. Nobody's going to say, gee, we'll just give up the California pork chop market. That's not going to happen. Uh, so they will have to have a certification process. And I will guarantee you that the people that are in favor of this law, the Humane Society of the United States, uh, will make sure it gets enforced, and they'll be ready to sue people. And, and they will. And, and so it'll be, it'll be enforced by this kind of, uh, uh, not by the government, but by individual people, uh, organizations. Uh, the Humane Society uh, was behind the original egg proposition. This egg proposition, by the, by the way, this, the one that's dealing with hogs, also says that now the hens, it's not big cages now, now it has to be cage free. So the egg industry that spent a billion dollars uh, getting ready for the 2015 proposition is now by 2020 going to have to meet the new standards, which are actually much harder to meet. And some of them had already started shifting to cage-free anyway, partly because there seems, in that case, there is some consumer demand. So it's, it's not like the case, I haven't, um, it, it, it's not like the case of like national origin where nobody really cared. In, you, can, you can buy, uh, in California now, probably 10% of the eggs are cage-free, something like that. So 90% of the people, uh, most people that are going to vo vote to make a requirement for cage-free now buy the non-cage-free eggs. So they vote to make something that they now want to do illegal. And they're very interesting economic papers to write on that, and I and others are, are working on it. But it's an interesting idea. You go into the supermarket, you buy something, you go to the ballot box and vote to make what you just, the transaction you just did illegal. That's, that's an interesting a bit of economics. Yeah, there's a guy way in the back. We got out of here at least one of the students. I guess you're a student, I don't know. Stand up and shout. I'm a diploma student. Yeah. So I was wondering, you mentioned earlier the CETA agreement with like an aspect to the beef industry. I was just wondering what your thoughts were on the, if the EU is using the, or the argument of hormone, hormones being on healthy whether that's true or not, it doesn't really matter, to artificially control trade and isolate the EU market. Yeah, so, so um, the, the U.S. and Canada produces a kind of beef that people actually like. Uh, it's got mar inner marbling, and, and the hormones uh, uh, facilitate that. You can't tell that the hormones have been used in the meat, so you can't actually test it in the meat. Uh, so, uh, and the European, and, and the U.S. And, and Canada also has access to, to grain at a cheaper price than they have in Europe. So we have a comparative advantage in a kind of meat that people actually like. Uh, as best I can tell. Um, in the 1970s and 80s when this came in, the European meat industry was the, were the ones behind uh, keeping the ban in place. And so it's not, not unlike a number of these cases. We were talking about the political economy earlier. Yeah, it was the meat industry that, that sort of got this enforced throughout. Now, I have no doubt now, if you went to Europe, there would be consumers that would at least want it labeled, and there would be, in fact, a serious consumer demand for labeling. But it's similar, you know, it's um, uh, a number of these things happen. Uh, I think a number of the, um, uh, there was an argument for uh, uh, 
bovine somatotropin to produce, which is a, um, a hormone in dairy cows that would increase, that increases milk production. Cows that have a lot of this produce more milk, as I understand it. Now, you know all the biology and chemistry I know. Uh, in that case, uh, the US uh, official, I know the guy that did it, held regulation, regulatory approval for that. No particular reason, just did it. I asked him why, he said, Monsanto wasn't very nice to me. That was his reason. They, they weren't polite enough. They said, this is a no-brainer, just do it. He said, you have to be more polite and ask me more sweetly and then I'll do it. By the time that delayed it for years, as a matter of fact, by the time it came in, uh, people were concerned about animal health. Uh, cows that give a whole lot of, these cows were giving more milk, cows that give more milk uh, 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 have mastitis and other problems, they have other health problems associated with giving a lot of milk, not with this hormone. Uh, and then there were rumors that it would, might not be healthy. And it was just at the level of internet rumor, really. Uh, but, it, but this delay caused that to build up so that now, at least in the United States, you will never see this hormone-treated milk in the supermarket. It's used in cheeses, so if you drink a glass of milk with your pizza, the pizza will have it, but your glass of milk won't. Uh, oddly enough, for reasons I can't figure out. There's one right here, and then we can get back to you. Is that all right? Yes. Yeah. My question is this. I can't understand in any context how a country the size of the U.S. compared to China and India can benefit from trade restrictive practices. Can they? No. Yeah, so the U.S. doesn't come out ahead uh, by restricting trade. You know, let me, let me say this. With, let me talk about China specifically. Uh, I also, oh, first, let me say, I also don't think India gains from all of their trade restrictive practices. But for India, so India has like 100% tariff on almonds. Why would that? Because they have a cashew industry that's politically connected to somebody's brother-in-law who knows somebody, and, it, and it's easy to understand. Uh, Politically, it's, it's no economics, but politically. And, 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 and India came out, India was uh, closely connected with the Soviet Union, was a socialist place. They, had, they came out of a very bureaucratic system when they were, were under the English system. And so they have this elaborate policy of, of trade restrictions. That if they've unraveled, they made a lot of progress, but they still have all kinds of trade restrictions. So if you wanted to say, we want to get India to open up, you know, I don't, I don't know how to do that. They're doing it slowly. China's a little different. Everybody I've dealt with who trades in China says you have to watch out. You can't trust people. The government, uh, there was a guy I knew who was selling processing tomato equipment in China. His rule was if you buy my equipment, I have to install it and make sure it's running right because my reputation depends on the quality of the product coming out of your tomato plant. And, and he was re an Italian guy named Rossi. He was really serious about that. He got it all up and running. The plant manager, he hadn't realized, he hadn't, didn't know who he was really selling it to. Uh, after she learned how to, re she was a great engineer, she had it up and running. He found out she was actually uh, Colonel Yao and was being transferred. She was, it was owned by the army. And the reason that they wanted to buy his plant, his equipment, because it was the best in the world and they could replicate it. And, and that's a problem. So how do you stop them from doing that? Somehow you've got to get their attention. I would think the best way to do it, I personally think the best way to do it, would be a WTO case brought by Canada, the United States, the European Union, Australia, New Zealand, and on down the line, together saying, we're going to sue you on this, and if you don't change the policies, then we'll actually retaliate in a way that we're all going to do this together and get their attention. So there are reasons to do that kind of stuff, but it's not just willy-nilly trade barriers doesn't make any sense at all. And there was one guy in the back, and then we'll come right here. Pass yeah, uh, I'm not going to talk. I, I've worked a lot on soybeans uh, off and on over the years because it's such a big crop. But uh, 
The guys, I, I, I've talked to people in the business, and every one of them will tell you it takes a while to build this back. Uh, I'll give you an example from the wine business. We don't sell a lot of California wine to, to, uh, to China. You know, a few million dollars worth, $100 million, I don't know. But it's not, it's not in the billions like soybeans. But these, what these guys have done is one by one gotten um, a restaurant, fancy restaurants and other places to put California wine on the menu, to spread the word. And they say this will set them back a decade. Basically, all the, all the menus that the guys in the fancy restaurants say, why bother? We, we can get wine from France. That's easy enough. Uh, there's wine in, in Argentina. There's wine from Australia. There's other places. And so they do fall back. I was in Brazil a couple of weeks ago, and, and they were not feeling all that negative about blocking U.S. soybeans. Uh, now, they have a problem that they're, you know, they're aseasonal, so that, in fact, walnuts is another one. They're blocking U.S. walnuts. Uh, the, I had a Chilean walnut guy in my house about two weeks ago, and, and he, was, he had been shipping walnuts from Chile to California to be processed in a special way, then to go to Asia, and he was going to have to not do that because he didn't want to be caught in the U.S. tariff. But, but they're going to run out of walnuts probably by, from, from Chile by about January. And then there's months and months until they get a new harvest. In Chile, they start harvesting in April, late March or April. So there's a big gap. So the, this seasonal stuff works. But you're right, it doesn't... Once you've lost a market, it takes a while to get it back. I don't know the specifics of the, of the soybean issue there. And they, right here. Yeah, in your mind, is there ever a case for countries having tariff barriers? I think there's a general feeling in Canada that because of our harsh climate and small population vis-a-vis -vis the U.S., that certain industries need to be protected uh, yeah. processing industries and so on because you know one one chicken plant in the u.s could almost swap the canadian market is that a real argument or yeah so there's an the argument here is uh, we're not very good at it so we need to be protected so we're allowed to do it because uh, uh, we wouldn't want to buy stuff from the people that are actually good at producing uh, and and uh, and that is the argument uh, the place where it was first popular in economics was called an infant industry argument. And it said, at the very beginning, we think we, we're going to get good at processing uh, chickens, but we're not good at it yet, so we'll just protect ourselves for a little while. Uh, and that's an argument that the steel industry has used in the U.S. for about 200 years. But pretty soon, they're going to be good at it. Uh, <laughs> No, it, 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 it is, I've never seen an infant industry that said, okay, now we're fine. They just don't. You, you, in fact, uh, the argument is that, in fact, industries uh, develop less well when they're protected than if they're competing. But the argument that says, uh, gee, Minnesota ought to grow its own lettuce just because it ought to grow its own lettuce, and the fact that it's frozen up here makes it harder to grow lettuce, well, that's just harder for us, but, but if you'll protect us, we will, and it, certainly you will. You, I mean, you can grow anything anywhere. Um, it's hard to picture. Now, occasionally you'll also get an argument, and this has to do with uh, 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 anti-dumping arguments, that says these other guys want to sell it to us at a low price and lose money while they do it. I worked with the Canadian cattle industry on an anti-dumping thing in front of the United States. And, and in fact, one of the smartest guys I ever dealt with was a president of the Canadian Cattlemen's Association. That, by the way, if you, that's an argument, that's an industry that somehow picks out real leaders. And this particular guy uh, in front of the US ITC said, you know, you're right, I lost money selling cattle last year. In fact, everybody lost money selling cattle last, last year. And if I would have known I would have lost money selling cattle when the year started, I wouldn't have sold so many cattle. But I didn't know. And, and I certainly don't lose money selling cattle on purpose in the United States. 
But the argument was, well, gee, he's losing money, and then he's going to corner the market. And then, boy, he'll, later he'll really raise the price of cattle in the U.S. But I've never seen one of the, and that could work in theory. I mean, we could go to the blackboard, if there was a blackboard here, we could, or whiteboard, we could go to it and we could draw the supply and demand model that could show that given the right kind of time horizon, I could drive you out of business and leave me with a monopoly, and then I'll raise the prices on everybody, and it could pay off losing money for a little while. I've just never seen that actually be true in practice. I just never seen it. Uh, you're certainly right that uh, a small uh, producer uh, who has high prices would be better off if he doesn't have to compete with somebody who's got lower cost of production. That's absolutely true. And that's the sort of standard argument. I understand it. So our, our harsh climate and scarce population is not hindering our wealth in any way. That's not the question, but Oh, well, wait a second. Oh, is that another? So we're... I'm talking about tariff barriers. Are we, we talking, you're uh, like, poor like, um, I don't know, Norway, Denmark. You know, if, if anything, uh, harsh climates are really good for wealth, as best I can see around the world. We're, we're the poorest places in the world, and they're right on the equator. Bob's going to join us on the dairy tour tomorrow, so oh, he's good. going to be able to ask this question. Good. Uh, so with that, I'm going to take one last question. Is there one last question? Oh, this young lady over here, because you had your hand much Oh, earlier, I'm right? sorry. You know, the, you, you needed to get over where you weren't behind the camera guy. And you're a prize winner, so we have, this is going to be a hard question. One of the big things that's come about, especially on social media, on behalf of the dairy farmers in Canada, is buy Canadian, buy Canadian, buy Canadian, buy Canadian. Um, there's a lot of the red herring arguments going around about ESG and how terrible it is, and how their somatic cell count standards are way worse than ours. Is that potentially setting Canada up for some, um, like, as they're trying to build non technical trade barriers? Is that something that could? Come back to the WTO later on? Uh, no, it, not if it's the industry. And here's, here's the deal. The WTO is an agreement between countries. So if the government of Canada had a set of policies that said, U.S. milk is poison, don't buy it. So you, you have a free trade agreement, but then you have the government actively trying to stop people from buying uh, uh, the other guy's stuff. Um, then I think you could. I haven't seen a case like that yet, but I think it could bring one. Uh, within uh, Every country has some laws like that where one company can't tell lies about another company. Uh, in the U.S. it's called the Lanham Act, where you're not allowed to, one industry can't tell lies about another industry's product. Uh, but, but that doesn't mean you can't brag about your own. So they can say, our, uh, our somatic cell count, which is, basically crap in the milk, uh, is really, something like that, is really low comp and stop there. But if you said theirs is really high and it's bad for you, I'll give you an example. Uh, um, in in the, uh, the U.S. has really low mold counts in processed tomato products. And Italy, ha because there's no humidity to speak of, in Italy, they have high somatic cell count. Uh, and California's standards, or the US standards, are for relatively low mold. So you can, and, 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 and Italy has never complained, no, no, we ought to have the right to sell you more mold in the tomato, because that's not a very, so you wouldn't have the US saying, if Canada had a low somatic cell count as a national standard, you probably wouldn't have milk producers in the US saying, no, no, we ought to have more crap in the milk. Uh, it's just not a real seller <laughs> uh, for most people, even if it's perfectly safe and you wouldn't be able to tell. But I don't see it. it it's an interesting idea if there was really an aggressive program saying their stuff's poison and it wasn't true. Yeah. That's so a great question from a very appropriate uh, individual named uh, Kraft Award winner or something. And so if you'll bear with me a couple of minutes, I just want to uh, thank Dan here.
And uh, I would ask uh, Surrender Campbells, who's uh, my steadfast assistant on many things, uh, especially when I was department head and now there, uh, who has had so much to do with uh, organizing the craft lecture. And as Surrender is uh, coming down, let's give Surrender a hand. For all I'm going to do something I've never done before. I'm just going to make a review here for, for Dan uh, and for individuals here, for the family. This is the 10th annual. We started off 2009 with Alice McCalla from Davis. We then went to 2010 with Daryl Ray from Tennessee, Bill Party from Minnesota, Dermot Hayes from Iowa, Bill Wilson uh, from North Dakota, Richard Gray from Saskatchewan, Colin Carter from Davis, Joe Glauber from uh, IFPRI, uh, one of the, the senior economists at the United States Department of Agriculture earlier from Washington, Brady Deaton from Guelph, and Dan Sumner from Davis. And so Dan, in thanking you, I just want you to know this is quite the Rhodes Gallery from uh, economics in North America. And it reminds me of an early 50s uh, song called Hillbilly Heaven. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And the, uh, it's a wonderful song, one of my favorite He's songs. He's older than I am. <laughs> <laughs> by, by Tex Ritter. Uh, but uh, it, this was all the great singers of all times in, uh, in country music, uh, which Bill is nodding his head to me remembering that song. And I just want to thank all the individuals that have had so much to do with this lecture series, uh, with this lecture series over uh, the, the years. And uh, as I say, starting off with Alex, and now the 10th annual here today with Dan Sumner, and uh, what an excellent presentation. And so I'd like to give Dan a small gift of appreciation. I'll actually save you the trouble of unwrapping it, uh, as <laughs> Randy has, has uh, done this very nice, which is, it reads the Daryl Craft, Daryl F. Craft Lecture, 2018, in recognition of your contribution to the legacy of Dr. Daryl Craft, Department of Agribusiness and Agriculture Economics. Thanks, Dan, to Dr. Daniel A. Sumner, Sumner for your presentation at the 10th Annual Daryl F. Craft Lecture, North American Agriculture in the Era of Trade Policy Turmoil, Reaffirming the Value of Open Markets. So thank you, Dan. Thank you very much.